All right, welcome back. Um, this is uh, the second paper session of the symposium and actually the last session of the symposium. We have a closing uh, remarks after this, uh, so don't go anywhere after this session. Uh, stick around for that. Um, but we have four uh, speakers that are joining us today uh, that are presenting their papers. Um, this session is 45 minutes and we've scheduled roughly half an hour for the presentations uh, and then left 15 minutes at the end for questions. So as you're listening to the talk, feel free to click that Q&A um, panel and enter your questions there and we'll make sure that the, uh, the, um, the speakers have a chance to answer those as well. Uh, so our first speaker, uh, Edzer Pebes Pebasma, sorry, I apologize for that. Um, I'll, I'll pass the stage over to you and if you want to share your screen, uh, we can get going. Yeah, thanks for having me here. So I'm going to talk about reproducing spatial data science applications. Uh, on this uh, symposium here today. Um, the idea is not is, is, is quite old of reproducing data, reproducing um, scientific work. It's, it's common practice in, for instance, the field of statistics for about 50 years or so. Uh, we started talking about this in 2012 in a publication I wrote with Roger Biven and Daniel Nust on using R for reproducible geoscientific research in a time that very few people were, were sort of raising it as an issue. Uh, we also had this book, um, Roger and Virgilio and I, first edition in 2008, 2013, the second one, um, which was fully reproducible from the start, which has been reproduced actually on a nightly basis to check whether everything still worked. And if things changed, if there were changes to any of the outputs on nightly builds, then basically we looked at the details and when this was a bug in the software. We, we could sort of report it back to package maintainers um, if they were if there was if they were intended changes to software. We could uh, add uh, addenda and uh, uh, corrections to the to the website to the scripts on the website. Um, there's a new book that appeared a few a few months ago uh, called Spatial Data Science, uh, where we basically define it as where we say data science is concerned with finding answers to questions on the basis of available data and communicating that effort. Besides showing the results, this communication involves sharing the data used, but also exposing the path that led to the answers in a comprehensive or reproducible way. So there we scope it as, as basically being part of the activity. Um, the preface uh, ends with the uh, notion that giving this book the title Spatial Data Science is not another attempt to define the bounds of the field, but rather an attempt to contribute to it from our three to four decades of experience working with researchers from various fields willing to publicly share research questions data and attempts to solve these questions with software. Um, this book is entirely online through this, through this link as well and, and is, is, is essentially uh, completely reproducible. It's now being rerun on a nightly basis in GitHub Actions. Um, the whole spatial data science software environment uh, or ecosystem uh, looks, like, looks like this. This is just open source. I don't want to talk about sort of proprietary software here. Um, you see that all these sort of things that people use, like Julia, Python, R, Quantum GIS, Postgres, and stuff, uh, all are sort of built around uh, common libraries, libraries that are underlying the software basically being reused by all these uh, environments for the R uh, package SF. We worked it out like this, where you see in the top, top side of the uh, page you see the, the R package dependencies and, and in, the, in the bottom half you see all the underlying C and C++ libraries that are being, basically being used and maintained by the, a much larger community that means also the Python community but also the sort of the whole geospatial community so that that creates a sort of a, a sort of a strong layer to to interoperability basically uh, uh, contracts on what what file formats are for instance what coordinate reference systems are in terms of implemented software. So this is very important that, that that is part of the thing that you use when you use actually R. Uh, you see that also when you load package SF in R here, you see that in the top, then it tells you which versions of GLT DAL and project links to, and that it uses the S2 geometry library for, uh, for operations on uh, geodetic coordinates. You can then ask R for the session info, and it tells you all about the operating system and all the R packages and versions involved uh, but it doesn't tell you about the system requirements or the external libraries linked. That is why that is important as well. Because you can link the same R package to different 
uh, to, to different upstream libraries and you could get different results from that. Um, we are now working on the on this book. Here is an example uh, on, on a version that is that's bilingual. That's not just looking at R, but it's looking at Python. We used Quarto to process this, and here you see a code example where you have a tab for the R code, and you have a tab for the Python code, and you can see how the same plot, well, not exactly the same plot, but sort of the same idea plot is created using R or created using using pandas, uh, using GeoPandas. Um, that um, other activities that we're now working on is sort of bringing these three data science language groups, Julia, Python, and R, uh, together in a workshop uh, 10 days from now, uh, where we will talk about a lot of common issues on data formats, on working with geodetic coordinates, on, on data cubes, and so on and so on. Community building also. Um, Right, so my statement about reproducibility is that you can talk a lot about it and think a lot about it, but the main thing is to basically just do it, and there are very few reasons to not do it. Except that in publication, the publication industry is not really sort of willing to, to help us forward and to change its habits. Um, so if you're, if you're now submitting a paper, even reading a paper or submitting a paper, it's usually PDF or HTML, and it, it may have, may have a link to something, but there are no, no guidances on how to do things. Um, the only thing you can do basically as, as sort of uh, peers, as reviewers, editors, or authors, is to not just accept a PDF if something comes only as a PDF without data, without scripts, how to reproduce things, then just simply don't accept it because it's not reproducible. That has been a very fruitful way that also saves a lot of time when selecting a journal, as if you're a student or, or a researcher, when selecting a journal, search in one that accepts notebook and offer to submit them. Um, submit to journals or conferences that have reproducibility guidelines, right? For instance, the Agile conference has now already for a couple of years reproducibility guidelines and does that. There is the code check activity where you can get this badge because somebody checked your code or so you sent your code to somebody and somebody checks it. But easy to think that the world needs more tools to help you do this, to, to create reproducibility. We saw this excellent workshop yesterday from Holler, Ken, Kendron and Bardin about reproducibility. And, and it's, it's very seductive to think that tools will solve this problem. I don't agree with this. I mean, we, we tried that and it didn't. It, the, the real obstacle is social, not technical. So the idea is to find, uh, or when you submit things, find or suggest reviewers who can understand who can and will run your code. How do you do that? Not just data and notebooks, you also have to document what platform, what operating system, the versions of the programs and so on you used um, and which upstream libraries were involved. You need to share also the runnable assets by either fixing the runtime, that means basically uh, putting, the, putting the software together, for instance, in a Docker container or a virtual machine, or by keeping maintaining the notebook. If you want, at least that in a year or two years from now, things are still reproducible because the world moves on. Uh, the other assumption is that that somebody else will go back in time. And that usually doesn't work so well. So uh, to finish up, reproducible, in my view, is that simple. It only has to be done. So thanks for your attention. So thank you very much. Um, I'm Lamenta Juhas. Um, I work at Florida International University in Miami. And this experiment that I brought to you is titled ChatGPT as a Mapping Assistant. And it's a collaboration between myself, uh, Peter Mooney from Menud National University, Ireland, and Hartwig Hochmer, uh, University of Florida, and my colleague here at FIU, Buyan Guyan. So just a couple of words about the motivations and like basically what brought us to conduct this little experiment. Um, we all know that we have like great sources of satellite imagery and, and aerial photographs today. We all know that it is very possible to either like trace the road geometries or, or use some other methods to extract road geometries. But basically what these things do is, uh, you know, give us like a huge set of, of uh, geometries that are basically just collections of lines. This is not a map yet. In order to come up with something that's more useful for, for navigation, routing, or any other application, we need more information as in attributes or, or tagging uh, of, to attach to these road geometries. So basically we set up uh, three research questions 
um, at this time when there's a lot of buzz and fuzz about chat GPT, generative AI, and so on and so forth. So basically, we wanted to see if generative AI is capable of, of suggesting uh, 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 attributes or tags of uh, roads based on textual description. And for the same problem, we wanted to see if we can improve the, the accuracy uh, through low cost methods like prompt engineering. And at last, we wanted to get at least some work started towards uh, uh, maybe like substituting human analysts uh, in this domain uh, with some other AI approaches, or at least see how that goes. So the case study and experiment, we are using OpenStreetMap uh, as, as, uh, as a case study, just because uh, if you've ever been involved in OpenStreetMap, you know that tagging can be very complex and difficult, uh, especially if you're just starting uh, uh, out with OpenStreetMap as a beginner, it is very confusing. This picture at the, at the lower uh, right um, side of this uh, slide, I found it on the OpenStreetMap wiki. It just illustrates like how complex uh, uh, this can be, even though it's just a regular CD scheme. Uh, scheme. Uh, we also know that we have uh, very detailed databases available of street level photographs uh, that we can potentially use to extract, uh, uh, like, you know, city scenes uh, of it. So we are using mapillary street level photos that's also available as, as open data under a Creative Commons license. Um, so here's our workflow. Basically, we have three analysts. Uh, one of them was a senior undergraduate student with some GIS experience who at the time worked at the GIS Center as an intern. The second analyst was uh, a sophomore who was just taking her first uh, intro to GIS class. And the third analyst was actually an artificial analyst. We used this Bleep2, which is basically a pre-training method that that enables large language models to, to also understand uh, images and to interact with them. Uh, you can find out more about uh, this method under this uh, uh, link. So basically, here, here's our workflow. We start with an open street map road. We make sure that the underlying road has a corresponding mapillary street level image. And then at the next step, uh, we perform a visual analysis. Basically, we are just asking analysts to answer simple questions about the scene, about what they see in the, in the photo, just like this. Uh, the first question was uh, about describing what they see in the photo. And an example response would be like a city road in an urban area along an elevated railway. There's a white sidewalk on both sides and trees on the left. And then we also ask other questions that we thought were relevant, uh, whether um, just to figure out who the primary users of the, of the road, uh, whether it's cars, pedestrians, bicycles, how many lanes were visible, what the surface of the road was, whether asphalt, concrete, and so on, uh, whether the road segment was a one-way road, and whether there were street lighting uh, presence on the, on the, on the, on the photograph. The next step uh, is actually building the prompt. Um, we will use some additional context. And if you remember, our second research question was about figuring out whether prompt engineering increases accuracy. And the last step, basically, we just feed the prompt to chat GPT that we are using as an example, and we just record the suggested uh, text. So we start with a baseline scenario. And everything starts with, uh, with an instruction. Basically, we just tell the model or tell ChatGPT that, hey, these are the inputs that you are going to receive. And we would like to receive the, the output in, in a JSON format. So the more interesting part is the first uh, uh, the baseline, which basically uh, just passes on the, the description of the photo, like a city road in an urban area, and so on and so forth. And we also add the, the other uh, informations that were recorded by, by the analysts. Uh, we tell JetGPT that the, the road was mainly used by cars, the surface and asphalt. Uh, there uh, were three traffic lanes, and so on and so forth. So this is the baseline scenario uh, that we just like came up with. And then to evaluate whether prompt engineering can, can increase accuracy, um, we also set out uh, three other scenarios. There was a locational context scenario where we also told ChatGP that the photograph was taken in, in Miami, Florida. And the idea here is that you know, roads can be very different across the world uh, in different areas, or so open street map tagging, tagging varies greatly uh, between geographic areas. Uh, there was another scenario where we also extracted uh, object detections from, from mapillary. You know, they feed these images through computer vision and, and they detect uh, certain objects like traffic lights, uh, uh, crosswalks, uh, street lights, signage, and so on and so forth. And we thought that it could also be interesting uh, uh, to see whether this information improves the accuracy or not. And then the last step, we combined the object detection and the locational 
context scenarios into one uh, uh, big scenario. And all of these additional scenarios also contain the baseline information. And the bottom of this slide, you see an example answer from ChatGPT. Basically, it's a JSON uh, with the, the highway value, which in this case was primary and also an additional uh, information about the number of lanes. So here are the results. We we just took like a very small study area near downtown Miami. Um, I think we had about 100 separate road segments. We of course made sure that they all have underlying street level photos. Um, and in an additional step, we also grouped the individual road categories into functional categories. Because if you think about it, uh, whether the road is primary or secondary, it's not a visual characteristic. So basically, that that is more like function that could be very different in, a, in an urban area and, and the rural area. So we thought that we will conduct these experiments on functional road uh, categories and evaluate the, the results accordingly. So what we see is that Accuracy increases with the level of detail uh, uh, with which the street scenes are described. For example, Blip2, the artificial analyst, um, their, its description were very generic. For example, a street with a with a street or of trees or you know just a very short sentence. Uh, the second analyst actually used a little more detail. Um, and analyst number one was the most detailed. Uh, that analyst used like cohesive sentences, uh, basically a short paragraph. And we see uh, that you know the level of detail increases the the accuracy. We also see that the uh, the accuracy can be increased through prompt engineering. Um, so what we see here is that uh, compared to the baseline scenario, uh, the object detection and locational context combined scenario. Um, can have almost 20% increase on, on average. And um, basically, tech suggestions at the best case scenario uh, were very close to, to 7% in our case. So basically, 7 out of 10. Uh, but it has to be noted that the blip to example, the artificial analyst, uh, was uh, only 33% uh, um, uh, uh, correct. So that's not much better than uh, random chance, or actually, it is worse. Sorry, I just have to wrap up. We're just running out of time. Thanks. All right. Sorry. So basically, for future work, we'll just like use a larger data set and 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 you know go uh, do the uh, uh, the usual steps. And we are also interested in figuring out whether we could like design a workflow that would automate the, the whole mapping task through the extraction of road geometries and attaching attributes uh, information with with these uh, methods. And that's all. Thank you very much. So I'm John Aiken, uh, and I've been working on a new uh, R package along with uh, my colleagues, Xu Jing and uh, Jonathan, um, and some other people uh, called 4D Modeler. So uh, if you kind of look around um, Earth, uh, you see a very complex system. I think we're probably all very familiar with the idea that the Earth is a complex system, but there's all sorts of things that kind of inter interlate uh, intercorrelate, they all work together, they're all doing random stuff. Uh, you know, uh, volcanoes and sea ice have have can have an impact on agriculture, uh, you, you know, as much as uh, CO2 or anything else like that. Um, and so, just to give you like a couple examples of how disparate these problems can be, um, here's two examples that have come out of our lab. The one on the left is um, the vertical land motion uh, due to different uh, uh, kinds of hydrology like uh, uh, glaciers or groundwater or stuff like that. Um, and on the right side is a COVID-19 infection rate. So we've used a, a, the same statistical model, um, but uh, these are obviously very different problems. And so what you end up with is that, uh, I think we all are kind of familiar with this, is that you end up with a problem that looks like this, where you say, like, how does something change in space over time? Um, and that problem seems quite simple, but like, as we saw, like, uh, I think um, Ed Sir did a really good job in the, the first talk showing like how complicated the technology stack is just to get the data uh, in your computer and analyze with R. Um, and so, and then if you wanna put a statistical model on top of that, um, well, 
uh, I think these people put it pretty well, where they say that the, the complex dynamic patterns with dual attributes of time and space create unique challenges for effective modeling and forecasting, i.e. it's hard. Um, but there's tons of solutions out there, whether they're common filters or neural networks or Bayesian models. Um, and so I'm going to focus on our solution, um, which is in the sea of solutions. But we, uh, we kind of are taking a, a, a different approach. So uh, 4D Modeler is a library um, that's built on the design principles of being visual, interacted, interactive, well-documented, user-focused, uh, and extensible through code. Um, uh, and, and I'll get to what I mean by that in a minute. Um, so uh, we do this by building Shiny apps that are built on top of uh, our Enla. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and those apps help you with a finite element mesh creation, um, how you specify your model, how you evaluate your model. Um, and we also uh, have uh, uh, notebooks uh, as part of the documentation. And we use a practice called Tegoro-driven software development. Um, so this is all built on top of the uh, inlaw solution, the integrated Laplacian approximation, um, which makes uh, these kind of models more computationally tractable. Um, and so you see 4D model as the, the tip of the pyramid. Um, it's really designed for people uh, who are coming in and saying, I have a spatiotemporal problem. I want to do some kind of st st sophisticated statistical modeling, but I'm not actually a statistician. I don't know how to pull all these things apart. Um, and so we want to make those people dangerous and go out and do all sorts of crazy things um, because you're probably not going to hurt somebody with your statistical model. Um, so, and, and, and so uh, what we've done is we've built um, shiny apps. So here's an example of the finite element mesh creation tool, which uh, it, uh, just loads up and it, and it comes with uh, some of the parameters for the mesh. Um, you can click on this tab and it'll show you the code so you can just integrate it directly into a notebook. Um, and you can also see data on top of it because uh, visualizing the mesh uh, is is a, a key component to understanding whether your mesh is working or not. Um, the second is that we, is that when anytime you're doing any kind of Bayesian modeling, you often have uh, uh, priors to to think about. And so, um, in in our case, we we developed this app that can help you. Uh, do different model specifications. So basically just creating different formulas, picking different priors, and then testing it on a subset of code. Um, so, so because uh, some of these models can take um, hours or days or longer to run. And so uh, a new user can be like completely overwhelmed by this. So having something that's quick and dirty that can kind of test this out of the box is quite nice. So this is all built on top of a software development practice that's being developed at the University of Bristol called Tutorial Driven Development. Um, and I'm just going to take a second to talk about this um, because I love it and I think it's the greatest thing ever and I think everyone should do it. Um, so Tutorial Driven Development uh, kind of cre it has uh, software developers and scientists co-create what a library should be. And what that means is that the tutorial of what the library should do should come first. Um, and so as uh, an example, you can have an R Markdown notebook or a Python notebook or whatever. This isn't just for our projects. It's across a bunch of projects. Um, and the scientists can write out their notebook to do the thing that they want. And even if the function doesn't exist in the library, they might add in like do X, Y, Z here. Um, and, and then the software developer comes in and sees and, and kind of iterates with the scientists to produce First, that functionality, and second, the kind of uh, robust uh, testing suites that software developers are used to writing, but scientists don't. And what this lets you do is it lets you integrate people like, like so here are all people on the team, where in the lower right-hand corner, Jonathan Bamber uh, is like an ice sheet modeler who hasn't really ever done this kind of coding before, but he can sit and write a tutorial um, uh, uh, along with... Uh, like Gareth uh, in the upper right corner, um, who's the who's one of the software developers on the team who can do all the coding 
uh, for that tutorial. So it really gets people across the entire hierarchy involved, but I mean, that's not the purpose of my talk. Anyways, um, so uh, just as an example, these tutorials have, uh, we've produced a, a large amount of documentation that kind of describes uh, all different kinds of ways to use uh, 4D modeler and the underlying libraries of Enla. Um, and so this is just an example of doing the prior exploration just uh, for the city of Bristol uh, for the COVID-19 problem uh, that, that uh, uh, we work on. Um, so I, I'd like to, uh, uh, this is exciting, it's new, we spent the last year working on it. Um, we don't, we, we're, we want users and we want uh, people invested and involved. Um, uh, so we've organized a series of hackathons. The first one will be in Norway and Oslo um, in November. Uh, so the QR code should take you to the link. Um, and uh, there it'll be two days of building tutorials, uh, working on the code, testing things out, hacking, watching everything fall apart. Um, it'll be a fun, wonderful experience. And there's some travel assistance um, uh, uh, for, for the, the hackathon as well. Um, so please uh, uh, sign up for this. And uh, thank you from the 4D modeler team. Uh, welcome to uh, talk about narrative-based approaches and uh, as a safeguard against bias and harm in algorithmic tools and services. I'm Paul Walter. I'm a first year PhD student. I have about 15 years of uh, experience as a software developer and database engineer. My supervisor is Dr. Victoria Fast. She's head of Fast Accessible Mapping and Mobility Lab. Introduction. Um, so first off, what are algorithmic tools and services? They're the, the implements produced by the confluence of big data, machine learning, and geo AI. And like all tools, they are just materialized mental models. And so mental models are simply the way a person understands the world around them. And as a model, they're, they're simplified versions of reality, with one part accurately reflecting reality and the other, which is the bias that does not. Spatial data science is also adopting uh, ATS. And we inherit a classical approach from science and engineering. And so this approach uh, aims to distill the underlying forms of the world into models made up of single immutable truths. As geographers, we follow suit with using statistical vector and raster models. And this approach is very useful for studying natural phenomena, but it can be misleading for studying people because it can devalue other ways of knowing, especially emotional and social understandings that are key to understanding people. And this can lead to uh, both ecological fallacy and mob issues. This approach can also lean too far towards toxic perfectionism and uh, respecting only the center of the bell curve and ignoring anything at the tails. And this becomes a, an issue for intersectionality, which can express itself as outliers. Um, types of bias, uh, biases like an iceberg. Uh, the top of it is statistical computational biases and currently the only one being addressed. Um, it's uh, examples are in data sets if they're unbalanced um, or self-driving cars when they can't recognize people in a wheelchair as pedestrians. Um, human bias is just under the waterline. Uh, they're the mental shortcuts that a, a person uses to deal with the complexity of reality. And examples can include confirmation bias, uh, where people look for what they already know. And this is in dangerous because uh, of how innocuous it is when it's embedded in an ATS, because they have subtle influence over important decisions in seemingly commonplace systems. Um, it can be hidden in terms of uh, linguistic elements called polysemes that, that occlude divergent meanings, uh, for, especially for equity, uh, oops, or well, equity related. Um, equity deserve populations. Okay, so three, how do we overcome this bias? And uh, as geographers and spatial data scientists, our role is in, in addressing bias begins with recognizing that ATS are not neutral forces. They're shaped by language, values, beliefs, embedded in our cultural, political, and economic systems that underpin their creation. Uh, one, one solution to this problem is to adopt the bottom-up narrative approach that has been used for over three decades in companies like Microsoft, Google, and Meta called use cases. It starts with a collection of narratives from a domain expert explaining their aims and interactions that need to occur to accomplish them. These are then decomposed into a specific narrative form, identifying the actors, their associated tasks, much like a script in a play called use cases. The use cases then are verified by the domain expert, ensuring that the aims and interactions are accurately modeled. Um, 
An imp uh, important aspect of this approach is that actors can then be generalized into personas, which can act as benchmarks for ATS creation, that both upstream, so like uh, pre-ATS uh, development in terms of data sets, and downstream for uh, before delivery to ensure that uh, there's safe interactions with marginalized groups. Uh, more tangibly, we can start with uh, adopting open source frameworks like IBM's AI Fairness 360 and adopt mature narrative-based approaches like object-oriented design and, and unified modeling language. Conclusion. Uh, so how to move into the future on more equitable terms. Uh, so in, in response to uh, Jeffrey Hinton's bag alarmism, we propose the real guidance can be found empowering a broader spectrum of individuals to engage in discussions in, in, uh, about biases and risks inherent in ATS. Uh, our approach underscores that ATS are intricately encoded narratives firmly entrenched with a specific ontological framework tailored for distinct mental models, which inevitably carry biases and therefore matters uh, whose mental models are being included. Uh, a tokenistic position in, in regards to this is dangerous and unacceptable in, for democracy and society at large. And to effectively counter the biases in ATS, we, we have to adopt more human-centered uh, approaches that can handle diverse ontologies uh, I'm not sure, I was so nervous. I'm not sure if I mentioned that diverse ontologies like um, how a walking pedestrian, the stairs represent a facilitator, where for a rolling pedestrian, it can, it can represent a barrier. So I, I think I skipped that part of it. And then uh, to conclude, as researchers, we need to remain conscious of the organizations we endorse, the problems and approaches and tools we use, as well as the inadvertent bias that we carry to our problem domain. Uh, thank you. And then do questions after that, but I guess we'll wait for that.